So welcome everyone. My name is Roland Vogel. I'm uh, the executive director of Codex, the Stanford Center for Legal Informatics. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here. This is an event we do every year, early in the year, to introduce our center to um, law students here and other Stanford students and to some other folks out there who are not at Stanford, but who also uh, who may not know uh, about the center and may be interested in, in getting involved in legal innovation and legal tech. And uh, so that's what we do here at Codex. So, all right, so I'm gonna be uh, talking for just a couple of minutes just to give you a, a quick overview. And then I will turn it over to some of my colleagues who are actually doing the, the real work in Codex. All right, so Codex is a center we were started about uh, a little bit more than 15 years ago here. We're a joint center between the computer science department and the Stanford Law School. So I like to use this kind of department neutral image of Stanford. So it's neither the law school, neither the computer science department. But conceptually, we are, we are settled between those two departments. Our focus is on using information technology to make the legal system more efficient for all stakeholders in the legal system and empower uh, every citizen, uh, provide legal empowerment through information technology. So we are a research center uh, here at Stanford. We've also somewhat inadvertently become a community of folks, sometimes uh, Stanford uh, students who are trying to do things differently uh, in the law and they leverage the tools that technology uh, provides and they create companies or you know, projects at, uh, in government. And so here are some of the uh, trailblazing companies that have been uh, started by some of the folks uh, that came uh, through our center. We have a broad umbrella, so our title is Center for Legal Informatics, and there's a lot of new ideas coming to the legal system and how we can use technology to, to manage legal documents better and to build new legal infrastructure. But our particular focus is on what we call computational law. And computational law is the branch of legal informatics that is concerned with the automation of legal reason. All right? So... The classic example we always like to use is, you know, how TurboTax is a system that has a representation of the tax code in computable form in it, and it can apply that to the situation of a particular user. There's many other examples. One area we focus on currently, and I'll tell you a little bit more in a little bit, is, you know, computable contracts and how can we use and uh, this, you know, technology we have to make contracts operationalized and self-enforcing and those kinds of things, all right? So we'll talk about that in, in just a little bit. All right. We've also been tracking a lot of the innovation. There's been a real explosion in, in legal tech startup activity in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, I should say. Um, and we're tracking many of those early stage uh, companies in the space. Uh, there's been much talk about uh, the disruption of, that AI is bringing to the to the legal system, uh, and I think you know maybe a little bit less talk about disruption in, in in recent years. But I think it has become clear that technology plays an ever more important role in the way we uh, deliver legal services. All right, so most lawyers have recognized that, and um, we're picking up a little bit of feedback here. Sorry. Everybody okay. needs to turn their um, audio off. Okay. Soon. So, um, all right. So, so my mantra has somewhat become, you know, for like um, to law students or other students who come to me and they ask, you know, what what should we be focusing on? Well, I say, you know, every lawyer has to know at least the basics of legal informatics. And more recently, I'm also sort of expanding that mantra to say that every technologist has to know at least the basics of the law and every business person has to know at least the basics of, uh, of the legal space is an exciting area for building a great uh, technology and, and great companies. All right, so we, we teach different classes. So we have a, a, a class every year on computational law. Uh, we taught uh, 
boot camp uh, classes on AI and um, social impact and the law. And we got a, we've been teaching policy practica, and I think we learned later from Megan. Where's Megan? Is she here yet? No. Uh, she's going to be remote. Oh, Megan's going to be remote. Okay, so Megan will tell us more about our upcoming class this winter quarter. All right, so then we run a lot of different events. Uh, one of our flagship programs is the Codex Future Law Conference that happens uh, every April here on the campus. And it really is sort of the event where the legal innovation community comes together and thinks about you know, all the important new developments in the space and uh, innovations coming down the pike. All right, so our center, if you, if you went up into the third floor here in the, uh, library building, you would just see you know, a couple of cubicles and chairs, and that's all the info in a couple of computers, and that's the, all, all the infrastructure we, we own as a center. Uh, the center is really made up by the, by the people that, that carry on its, its vision. And I'm proud to say that I think we have some of the brightest minds in the space that are affiliated with our center and are doing really important work. And they work on a number of different projects, um, some of those projects are sort of carried out by a core team here at, at Stanford. Others are carried out by folks that are, you know, maybe in a different at a different university, or they may even be in a in a company, but they're working on some really important uh, project in uh, uh, legal tech. All right. So one of the projects I sort of. Uh, alluded to briefly already at the beginning is our Codex Insurance Initiative. So imagine you your insurance policies would be created in a format so that you could actually ask questions to your insurance policy and it would give you uh, an intelligent answer to your question. And you could figure out next time you get a rental car, you could actually figure out if you're, you know, Main car insurance will also cover your rental car, just for example. Um, and uh, so there are many other examples, but, but we are working on technology that is trying to make that a reality, okay? So you don't have to work through um, legal, you know, hundreds of pages of legalese and still not understand and still not get a, a, a real answer. So we have a big, big effort going on this. Hello, Jerry. Jerry <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, great. So that's our insurance initiative. And we have a, a growing group of folks here, students and staff members and faculty working on this question, right? How do we, how do we create insurance policies that computers can reason with and can give us real answers to our questions? We have a big effort going on on compu uh, computer, computational antitrust, uh, Professor uh, Thibaut Schreppnell will be speaking a little bit about this effort. And we have a very active blockchain group and a blockchain education initiative. We also learn more about that uh, from, from our fellows working on this project. And a whole bunch of other interesting projects. So I, I won't have the time to go through all of those. You can go on our website and see the list of projects and the people who are leading those projects. And if some of the projects are particular interest to you, I encourage you to reach out to the uh, project leaders. All right, so with that, um, I will now turn it over to our uh, first um, uh, speaker. Uh, that is uh, Nicole Shanahan. Uh, Nicole, are you there? Hi. Yes. Okay. Nicole is joining us remotely. Here is Nicole. All right. Great, Nicole. Oh, are you going to share some slides or are you just going to I am. I'm sharing right now. Can okay. you see? Great. Yes. Perfect. All right. Over to you, Nicole. All so right. Nicole's been a, a fellow. She was a res residential fellow here at Codex. Uh, she is now a non-residential fellow working on uh, carbon credit markets. And we're excited to learn about your work. Nicole, over to you. Great. Sorry. Let me try to get you the uh, presentation mode. One sec. Close this. How's it look? Good. Okay, great. Um, good to see you all. Uh, there's a little bit of feedback on my side, but if it sounds okay to you guys, I'll keep going. Yes, please keep going. We don't hear any feedback. Okay, great. 
Okay, so um, here's a quick update on pegging a carbon removal coin to the carbon credit markets. A lot of activity um, over the last year, and just wanted to update you guys on what, I mean, looking back on last year's presentation, it was so um, simplistic and naive. <laughs> and, you, you know, given the pace that crypto moves, um, you know, and, and how it's impacted the carbon credit world, it's it's just remarkable. It's like, you know, I compare it to five years um, in other industries of development happened within one year here. So going back to last year's presentation, you know, the question I posed then was, um, can we, you know, really think about the government getting involved in supporting the carbon credit markets and what would the role of going on chain um, provide in terms of reduction of transaction costs and verification layers. So um, just as a quick recap, um, the idea would be that any project that sucks CO2 out of the air um, would, quali would qualify for this on-chain um, carbon credit marketplace. And some of the examples of these projects are farming, rewilding, um, seizing oil pumping, conservation. And a lot of this came out of um, inspiration from Kim Stanley Robinson's book, The Ministry for the Future. So since then, a lot has actually happened in this space. <clears throat> Let me move this real quick. So the the Carbon credit markets in general have been very active. Um, there's quite a few fairly sophisticated financial instruments. Um, there's a huge um, uh, clearinghouse platform that just received $400 million of investment from Blackstone. I'll talk about that at the end of this presentation. Um, so the, ex the existing market today really looks like um, a bunch of project developers develop these carbon drawdown efforts that are either short, medium, or long-term um, drawdown projects. They go through verification through one of several dozen um, respected uh, nonprofit organizations that are able to grant credits um, and register the projects on their you know, internalized um, uh, nonprofit registry. And there's really about 10 of them that most of the buyers of markets recognize as having the highest kind of fidelity uh, of, of quality of credit. Um, so given that, you know, there's been many attempts in the crypto space um, to take those registered credits and put them on chain. And there's really three ways this is happening today. So the first way is just via a protocol. And the most popular protocol to date has been Toucan Carbon Bridge, um, which is part of this network of developers um, that has strong relationships with um, KlimaDAO, K-I-L-M-A, KlimaDAO. And Klima also has a consumer application. The second is a fully verticalized marketplace. So think about a carbon credit um, marketplace that um, issues the credit, does the verification, and also issues a coin. Um, Nori is an example of this. So I'll talk about each of these um, via a, 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 um, a uh, very clear example in just a moment. And then the third is via a DAO or token services platform. So, you know, protocols really require developers to be very deeply involved. Um, Flow Carbon is an example of a company that says, okay, we're going to internalize the developers within our company and provide tokenization as a service. So, this is how the Tucon Carbon Bridge um, protocol works. There's a lot here. This is on their website. So if you go to Tucon Carbon Bridge, you can see how they 
um, they, they historically have worked just with uh, VERA credits. VERA is kind of the top ranked registry for carbon credits. So effectively what they were doing was they're saying, okay, we're going to take the VERA um, registered credits and we're going to kind of process them through a verification system and put them on chain. Um, and what comes out is this TCO2 token. The problem was is in May of 2022, VERA banned two con carbon bridge from doing this because they were doing it without buy-in from VERA. And VERA felt that because of this, there was a lot of confusion created around the value of the credit that then became a token that was traded in a separate marketplace from the um, existing carbon credit marketplace. So there was these two worlds that were living side by side. And because of it, it was becoming too attenuated from the actual carbon drawdown project. And they said, this is going, we, we have to protect the quality of the work that we do at Vera. And we feel that um, this kind of crypto representation is, is actually harming that quality. So they banned it outright. And, and that's been a very interesting um, issue playing out in the field. And if you're interested, I, there's lots of great content and lots of great um, uh, you know, input from experts on um, you know, what the issues are and how we might overcome. There's actually an open consultation process going on right now. Um, here's an example of Nori. So Nori is its own marketplace. They're also a verifier. So they compete with Vera on verification and issuance of projects. They work just with farmers and they're issuing their own coin. So there are a top to bottom um, uh, universe of carbon uh, marketplace and carbon tokenization. Um, and it's very interesting. I've actually purchased a few credits from Nori in the past because I like funding um, draw uh, farming-based drawdown projects. Um, and they're issuing the coin directly to farmers, which is really interesting because if you think about like creating an insular universe where you can control every aspect of the marketplace and the downstream token, um, it can actually reduce transaction costs overall and increase transparency because they have just 100% authority control of everything that's going on. So I think this is one model to really watch as well. And then finally, Flow Carbon. So Flow Carbon um, is a company that is a, launching a DAO. Um, they have a whole services vertical that helps carbon credit project producers um, go on chain on their network. Um, they have something called a GNT, a goddess nature token that they um, uh, take carbon credits and turn them into their own token. And that token can be traded on the open market. It's a little bit speculative. They do take a fee for the, their service um, and it's very early on. So this is one to uh, watch. So as I, as I look at these three options and I take a step back, do I love any of them? No. Do they really solve for what um, we're trying to accomplish here? No. And so I'm kind of looking at examples outside of the carbon credit markets on how we can tie the token and the carbon credits themselves to um, almost like a treasury vehicle. And I, I'm looking very closely at Circle and what they've done with um, the USD coin and USDCs. Um, this is, this is a, again, like a, a, a can of worms and it's and it's somewhat hard to understand, but effectively what Circle did was they said, okay, government, we want your involvement. We're going to open our books and Nicole, we're going to let us. Yes, I can hear you. So I have to, we have to uh, kind of wrap it up quickly. Okay. okay. So I, I know there's a lot to learn about this, but really the main thing is to kind of introduce the project and you, sure. and then if people have more questions, but uh, totally. it's a fascinating project. So please, like, could ask you to wrap up that'd be great. Okay. okay. 
Um, so all in all, very interesting space. Um, if you'd like to get involved, reach out. I'm on LinkedIn and I'll talk to you guys soon. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nicole. I'm sorry, it's uh, excited, but we have like a lot more people to uh, to hear from. And the next gonna be, thank you. Thank you, maybe, is there a question in the room? On, anyone has a question for Nicole? All right, so reach out to Nicole via LinkedIn if you're interested in learning more about uh, her work on uh, carbon markets. So thank you again, Nicole, it's great to have you. Thanks for joining us. All right. All right, so uh, Rebecca is next, where's Rebecca? In the back here. Oh. oh, all right. So um, we started out with uh, blockchain. Blockchain is not is one of the things we're doing, but we're hearing more about the blockchain, but this time more about the blockchain policy. And uh, Rebecca is the leading expert on blockchain policy. So you need your slides up? Yes. All right. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I guess you keep heading next for the next. Yes. Okay. Y'all hear me? You can use it to it in. Oh, here. Oh, no, it's, it's okay. I can do this. Oh, thank you. That's great. Convenient. Oh. Stop so. projecting. We have to get yeah, I can do it. So, sorry, guys. This is actually. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. The recording. Oh, I see. A little better. Okay, that's fine. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. 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 We just shared from this computer before, and then we unshared. So, is I think the folks in the control room. Oh. Uh, is it? So while they're setting that up, can, can you all hear me? Can you all hear me even in the back? Yeah. Oh, we got it. We got it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much for like. That's okay. People can hear me in the back, right? I'm, well, we I'm have a lot of Oh, oh, so. okay. Sorry. Um, I'll I'll just I'll hold off. It'll be quick. Yeah. Thank you. Um, cool. So. <laughs> Thank you guys for being here. Uh, no, it's it's funny. I was, I was just about to say that I, I was in law school way back when. And um, it, it's funny how learned behaviors are never unlearned um, because I zipped right to the back of the class where there was no desk. So I couldn't put my name card out so no one could call on me, um, which is obviously not a concern anymore. But um, I, I went to another law school where they uh, call on people and make it a horror show, i.e. Harvard. So um, anyways, uh, so thank you guys for being here at Codex. Um, is awash with people working in blockchain, um, but there is a dedicated blockchain group. And as Roland mentioned, we do focus on the policy angle of it. And most of us in this group, what's nice is that we do have legal backgrounds, we have policy backgrounds, uh, but more importantly, a lot of us are also entrepreneurs. And so we understand from a practical perspective what works in the space, uh, what the technical implications are, and sort of what the cutting edge of the technology is. Because I, I think for a lot of policymakers, that is the blind spot, uh, is where this technology is going. Uh, so with that, um, let's, let's jump into it. Uh, my, my background, by the way, I'm co-founder and CEO at Saga, uh, which is a Web3 protocol focusing on infrastructure uh, for the metaverse. Uh, it's my second crypto startup, so I've been in this space for a while. But OK, back to the group. What does it do? Uh, so blockchain, as, as you all know, it's enabling a new um, wave of use cases in uh, Web3, particularly with decentralized architecture. Uh, it is very, very early, and uh, we're just starting to find out what are the really viable use cases for blockchain, um, but also how do we start to fold in other fields uh, that have been working on really exciting, cutting-edge uh, technologies that are applicable to law as well, such as computational law, which is how Codex was founded. Um, so we are uh, looking to share... Um, uh, 
uh, signal to noise points of view, um, free of any sort of tribalism between different blockchain ecosystems, uh, different groups that are working on blockchain. It's meant to be a great convening space for experts to talk about blockchain and um, sort of what's what's real in the space and what's uh, what's new and stuff that we have to look forward to. So why do we create this group? Um, we wanted it to be a subset of the work that Codex already does on computational law. And we wanted to build off the existing base of research and expertise. Uh, so some of us who came into the blockchain group had already been working with Codex in other areas, uh, but we got interested in blockchain and, and so started this group. Um, and we, we want um, this group to really enhance what other Codex activities um, are. So we um, will support the broader Stanford law community, but also other Stanford departments that are working on blockchain, including CS, um, SimSys. I, I'm trying to like run through all the science majors here at Stanford because I went to undergrad here. Uh, but we work with all those different departments because again, we're trying to be that convening area where uh, people who are working on blockchain from all different angles uh, can come here and have sensible policy discussions. Cool. Um, so what is it that we actually do? What is uh, what is the week to week look like? Um, so we definitely do research and we publish informed perspectives around blockchain ecosystems. It's important to uh, keep providing good education in this space. There's a lot of noise, uh, as you guys probably know. So uh, we want to uh, publish things that are uh, accurate and factual and helpful to the broader community. Uh, we track, guide, and influence policy and regulations in the space. Uh, so actually, mid-November, uh, there's going to be a Digital Currency Week here at Stanford, and uh, various different departments are going to be uh, contributing to that conference. Uh, but uh, for us, we are helping them stand up this um, two-day workshop on sensible policy regulation in blockchain. And that, that'll be quite exciting, actually. We'll have regulators coming in from all over to talk about how, how do we regulate this space, not just DeFi, um, which is distributed finance, but also digital assets as a whole. Uh, we want to become an inclusive and neutral forum for regulators and policymakers to convene uh, with academics, professionals, and technologists. Again, um, this is the hardest thing to crack in policy is to have sensible conversations where people are actually communicating with one another and hearing one another. Uh, we all speak different languages, honestly, um, academics and uh, entrepreneurs in the private sector and then policymakers in, in the public sector. Uh, it's it's very, very hard, even when they're, we're in the same room to understand one another, but we hope that at Codex, we can make a contribution to that. Uh, and in terms of the things that we focus on, so blockchain has many, many use cases. Uh, it, the reason it's called Web3 is it's a successor to Web2. Uh, having said that, at Codex specifically, we want to focus on legal issues, opportunities presented by blockchain um, uh, for existing legal frameworks, smart contracts, governance design. Obviously, you hear a lot about uh, how smart contracts can actually replace a lot of the kind of contracting that we do now. Uh, and of course, legal empowerment, legal services uh, using blockchain technology. Uh, there is a publication that is dedicated to exploring a lot of these topics. It's the Journal of Blockchain Law and Policy. Um, Steve Nam, who's part of the blockchain group, runs that. Uh, so in terms of um, the content there, I'm sure you can go to the website and, and check that out. Uh, in terms of submissions uh, or any interest in collaborating with the policy uh, journal, then I, I'm sure that you, you could go to the website, find that out as well. You can also contact. Roland or, or any of us in the blockchain group to get involved. Um, there is a Stanford Blockchain Education Initiative. Uh, again, it's kind of a natural fit, Stanford's academic environment, uh, and we have a lot of content to share about what is real in blockchain. Uh, so we feel that this is a, a pretty big responsibility on our part. So uh, we're working on a publication of complete blockchain glossary. So what is Web3? What is staking? What is DeFi? Um, what are all these terms that you hear uh, when people talk about Web3 in either academic literature or in the media? Um, it's, it's a very opaque world. Uh, and as someone who comes from industry, even I have to admit that. So we're trying to shed a little more light on what we're all about. Um, there's a creation of an open to the public blockchain literacy 101 bootcamp series. Uh, so I, I think a lot of people would be interested in this sort of thing. But 
this is really just to educate on the basics. If you are looking to work in blockchain, what do you need to know? If you are looking to buy crypto for whatever reason, uh, what do you need to know? Um, yeah, I probably shouldn't have said that last part, but that's okay. <laughs> All the securities people will forgive that, right? Um, and then, of course, uh, hosting of blockchain concerns for lawyer seminars. Uh, so this this is a cutting edge legal space, and um, way way uh, early in say 2014, 2013, there were actually not many lawyers, um, particularly from big law, who were willing to touch crypto. Uh, because it was seen as, just, you know, kind of something for nefarious purposes or just not very well understood as an asset class. Um, that has obviously changed. Uh, but having said that, I, I think all the lawyers are trying to figure out uh, what to do in this space. And honestly, just, again, uh, talking from a client perspective, if you go to any large law firm, the vast majority of them will have different answers for you on um, pretty basic foundational questions of what is an asset. You have to list this with the SEC, et cetera. So, uh, it's a lot of a um, lot of space in which, in which to create here, uh, and then finally, um, these are the ways to get in touch with us. Uh, so we we do have a homepage that's linked to the Stanford Law website. Um, Co-chairs of this group are Tony Lai um, and Kush, um, both of whom are are in industry. Tony's got his own startup going, and then Kush is at Falcon, which is an exchange. Uh, and then I mentioned that we we also have uh, a journal that's led by Steve Nam. So we look forward to hearing from you guys. Uh, and I think that should be it. Thank you yeah. so much, Rebecca. Yeah, so I think uh, what's uh, what's probably interesting to know is that uh, our general mantra in Codex is, you know, compatibility technology for the legal system. Um, and so we're not so much concerned with sort of policy and legal questions. We're concerned with the technology for the legal system. But in the blockchain context, our focus is really on the policy and, and the legal issues surrounding blockchain technology. And, and, you know, there are many reasons why we decided to make space for this effort. Uh, one of which is that we have just, you know, a, a lot of real thought leaders in our ecosystem that, that have really important um, ideas and, and insights in the space and nobody else was doing it. So, <laughs> so. So we thought uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start an effort in that space and, and it's a really important initiative. And if you want to get involved, uh, you know, reach out to Rebecca uh, or some of the other folks in our blockchain group. So uh, are there any questions for, for Rebecca? No? All right, so you know how to reach her. You know, know the face to the name now. So thank you, Rebecca. It's great to have you. Um, let's turn it over to uh, Oliver now. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, Oliver. There's a lot of things going on in the center, and we wanted to give you a good overview. Okay, great. So, so Professor Goodenough, he's affiliated faculty with our center. So, do you know how to switch over to the? Which one were we on before? Um, and are, are folks seeing my my screen yet? We no. can hear you. We can't see you yet. So, um, this one. I should, I should be. Uh, um, I was also trying to share my, my screen with, with, with the. Um... We remote able to see your see, we are able to see your screen remotely. Okay, can you see my? You don't. You're not seeing my screen. Yeah. Yes, I do. Second. And it also sounds like there's a terrible echo step. <gasps> So you may have to turn your volume down a bit. Uh, yeah, I'll turn. Yeah, I think you should. But do you know how we can actually get him on the screen? Uh, he's up on my in the Zoom meeting. I don't know how to get him up on that screen. All right, I'll, so, st I'll stop sharing so and, you, and try sharing again here. So can you maybe get the IT, IT, IT folks to help? Yeah, so okay, in the meantime, I will uh, intro uh, Oliver. Oliver is a law professor. At Vermont Law School, he's been an affiliated faculty with our center for uh, many years, and uh, he's doing some really groundbreaking work on computable uh, contracts, especially as applied uh, to the insurance industry uh, as part of our Codex Insurance Initiative. And uh, yeah, Oliver, oh, you guys don't it's right here. All right. 
Oliver. Okay, you can see you can see me. Are you, you are you seeing my screen as well? We can see you. We can hear you, and uh, we see your screen too. Uh, Over to you, okay. Oliver. We'll we'll have to magnify it a little, but switch. I mean, have Oliver smaller. Thanks. I guess. How do we do that? Yeah, can I do that? Can you can you flip that? Anyway, I, okay. I well while, while that's going okay, on, yeah. thank you. Uh, Five uh, minutes. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Roland, for your introduction. Uh, uh, are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, the context, the reason that why we're uh, having this initiative is that it's a really great use case for our study of computational law more generally. Uh, the computational law approach is, as, as Roland has mentioned, how do you express uh, 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 legal uh, formulations, legal rules, legal um, um, opinions, all of those things into a code, into computer code as a sort of native uh, place for it to be, be um, uh, described. Uh, we're used to looking up word-based rules, um, if this, then that, if this other thing, then something else. Um, and those, those kinds of legal rules are, are, are effectively very easily um, um, uh, expressed or re re readily expressed, I should say, in computer code. And the trick is to figure out the translation back and forth between, between the legacy uh, system of uh, written law and the, uh, uh, the emerging system of, of code-based expression of rules. Uh, and, and contracts are great because they have a limited structural variety, uh, so they're a great starting point for this process. And insurance contracts are particularly a good target because in insurance, the contract is the product. The contract is, is effectively the product. Uh, we're not using the contract to sell, sell um, uh, 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 widgets or books or whatever it is, but we are using the contract as the expression of the thing that people are getting. And in our initiative, there are, are, are five uh, elements I'd like to just uh, touch on briefly. Uh, first is the computer science research and development aspect. Secondly is the legal and business research and development. Thirdly is the approach of, 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 of uh, uh, to user interfaces and through design research and development, uh, publication and dissemination, and then some community development as well. Um, the uh, uh, computer science research and development activities are, are, are very, um, uh, uh, extensive, but uh, let me summarize them saying that, that there's a, a kind of programming that is particularly suited to um, uh, this kind of, of representation of legal rules. Uh, and it's called logic programming. Uh, some of you with a programming background may be aware of, of this approach. It is an approach that, that uh, essentially uh, 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 superimposes uh, logical queries on um, um, uh, sets of data, on sets of facts about the world. Um, and if, if uh, again, if, if, if fact X is true, then, uh, then rule, this rule may apply. If fact X is false, it may not apply. It's, it's a, a way of breaking out the logic and the, 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 the uh, factual elements. And it turns out actually that all kinds of legal, existing legal statements are, are word-based versions of this formulation. So, so uh, logic programming is, and developing logic programming approaches for, for this it has been a, a key element of our, of our uh, comp sci research and development. We're also, we've uh, created some, some prototypes over different insurance domains that can demonstrate how this works. Uh, and we're exploring at the moment further functionalities. Um, for instance, the one that we're exploring heavily at the moment is can we use this approach to identify and then help people rectify coverage gaps or coverage overlaps? Uh, if you rent a car, do you need to buy the, the car's insurance or does your home insurance cover? Again, how would we set up a system that allowed that kind of, of, of approach? Moving on then to the legal uh, uh, business, legal and business research and development, um, which is uh, certainly the uh, 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 for for law students perhaps the most accessible piece of this is uh, first of all there's the law of computable insurance contracts and there's three elements to this first of all there's the uh, the enforceability of of uh, um, uh, code based contracts generally and in the U S we are uh, fortunate to have uh, the UEDA law the Uniform Electronic Transaction Act which has been adopted by 49 of the 50 states uh, and the, the 50th has something that looks a lot like it uh, and this act basically says if, a, if a, a contract is otherwise a contract, it will not be invalid because you've used code in, in describing it. Uh, so, it, and it also says that you can use remote uh, electronic signature and signature substitutes in terms, uh, instead of a, a signature written by hand. This makes um, uh, uh, things like DocuSign possible. So essentially we have law in place that says as a generalized matter, contracts can be, be in this uh, computational form, in this code-based form. Uh, we, uh, insurance, however, is subject to a lot of other uh, 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 regulatory uh, legal uh, um, oversight, 
And a key player in this is the National Association of uh, Insurance Commissioners, which, which is a, a kind of clearinghouse for regulators across the United States. And we've been working with them to develop approaches for how this kind of contract could be dealt with by, legis by regulators, because that, the, the regulatory uh, gatekeeping is, is a key function in insurance and, and satisfying that is a key element here. And then there are the general data privacy protection, et cetera, the, 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 the common things for, for um, uh, uh, web and computationally based uh, information storage and, and sharing. The second piece has been also looking at the structure of the insurance bargain itself. What is that structure? How is it expressed? What is the logic of its classic elements? How is it expressed? Because if we're looking to translate that into code, we really need to break it down into its fundamental uh, 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 building blocks. And we've been working on that. Uh, to, to, to provide that, that basis for the, for, for the translation into a code-based system. Our third research uh, direction is um, uh, to really look at this from the standpoint of how is the user interface? What's the user interface? What's the user experience as they go forward with this? Uh, and uh, this ties us, this initiative into some of the design, the legal design elements that Codex has been working with on. Great, great, um, 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 uh, topics for, for consideration and, and really important ones as we go forward to try and improve how, how the law works with people. Uh, and uh, in this uh, design, there's this notion of sort of human-centric design. You need to understand the goals, needs, cognitive processes of the humans who are interacting with a legal system or a law-based system of some kind, and really um, um, uh, tailor the experience that we're creating so it becomes friendly, at least as friendly as possible, to, to those users. Uh, we've been um, uh, sponsoring research interviews, that kind of thing. Um, uh, there's customer facing elements. What does a customer need to know? How is it responsive, transparent, consistent? Those are among the, the, the elements that our research is turning up that, that are important to a customer. On the company facing side, can it help with policy design, um, implementation, administration? How are claims done? What are data oh, analytics? Oliver, can you hear us? Yeah. Hey, so I, I was just hoping that you could. Uh, Accelerate a little bit or wrap up because I see a bunch I, I of wrap, more slides. I wrap it up. I apologize. We have a you bunch more people who we want to give some time to. Okay. My apologies. Here, but let this me move is... on. So regulatory facing as well. Publication and dissemination. We have a series of short papers that are out there. MIT law report. Uh, we have scholarly events. Uh, we have a remote workshop series, and we have in-person workshops that are at Stanford in London and, and in other places beyond that. Uh, and our uh, final, uh, 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 final. Um, Target on this is community building. We have outreach activities, the workshops we've described above. Uh, we're creating a community of interest and practice from insurance companies, regulators, suppliers, academic partners. Uh, and we rely on them for co-hosting meetings, uh, publications, etc. So there's there's an opportunity in this um, uh, initiative to to uh, work with other folks, uh, um, uh, folks around the world. Uh, 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 in the insurance capitals of London and Singapore. We're working with people. Uh, there there's there's a lot of, of interaction around our community building as well so there we go that's my summary on thank and, you um, thank you so much Oliver, model. and thank you thank you for joining us and giving us this overview on our codex insurance initiative and if you folks are interested in learning more and getting involved you know please reach out to oliver or to me and we'll get you um we'll get you involved in the project so and my apologies to all the speakers for kind of rushing you but we are we were very ambitious because we're so excited about all the great work that uh, you guys are doing and we wanted to share it with you all uh, but we have five more speakers and we have we actually want to we, we actually want to uh you know finish around in about 20 minutes or so so you all have some time to uh to get your grab your lunches and eat your lunches before your afternoon classes start so so if i could just ask the next speakers and we have two online and two here uh to maybe uh restrict themselves just to four minutes of doing sort of four minute kind of elevator pitch of your <laughs> presentation that would be very much appreciated um and uh, i think next up is peter who's uh who's been an llm student here at the law school about 10 years ago and then uh, started a um, company um, called legal.io that the, at least the original mission was to bring together people with legal needs and pe people with the right legal expertise in kind of a marketplace environment. But Peter stayed involved in Codex and taught uh, law students coding. And one of the projects he'd been working on was uh, this database I mentioned to you, the, the Codex uh, Tech Index that uh, tracks early stage legal tech innovation. Peter, you have four minutes. <laughs> I know you can do it. 
I will go quickly. Can you hear me well? We can hear you well, yes. Great. So, um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for taking uh, a minute to learn more about Codex, and in particular, the Codex Tech Index. My name is Peter Gunn. Um, I started my career in the legal industry as an attorney back in Belgium at DLA Piper, and uh, then did an LLM at Stanford Law School in Law Science and Technology in particular. And that's how I got involved at Codex. Um, and it's truly been a life-changing community for me. And I want to uh, share a bit about my work uh, and also talk about ways you can get involved. Uh, in the day-to-day, -day, I'm now the CEO of Legal.io. We're a marketplace for legal talent that's completely geared towards the enterprise vertical. We raised about $15 million in venture financing since uh, starting the business. And so if you ever want to talk about your entrepreneurial journey as well, these are ways to reach me. Uh, you can find me at Digital Lawyer on most social platforms. Now, what was very interesting to me about Codex was the fact that it brings together a wide variety of stakeholders to work on improving legal systems, making them more efficient, transparent, and accessible. And in particular, when I joined SLS in, in 2010, you're looking at this large and ever-growing legal market, like almost a trillion dollars, um, and, and technology is starting to play a more and more important role in that market across a wide variety of um, technologies. And so Codex provided like a really good grounds to learn more and dive deeper into those. And so back in uh, 2016, we started um, a class called Code is Law, which brought together law students learning how to code. And the output of, of um, one of the classes we did was the Codex Tech Index. The Codex Tech Index is a curated list of legal tech companies um, that are essentially having an impact on the legal field today. Um, it's curated by volunteers. It has about 2,000 companies that it covers, and it's a publicly available data set, one of the only ones of its kind. You can find it on the web at techindex.law.stanford.edu. Now, what's interesting about this index is that it categorizes data on startups, like what do they do, where are they located, when were they founded, are they staying alive? Um, and, and this is a, across a wide variety of verticals, from legal research um, to practice management, to document automation, to legal analytics solutions, to online marketplaces. We track all of this technology and see what's happening in the market. We're tracking uh, across a variety of categories, nine in particular, and uh, definitely in the last years have seen the most traction in terms of document automation, marketplaces, practice management. It's where the dollars are flowing in terms of investment and also where the most activity is happening. Um, we're tracking um, over 50% of the companies we're tracking is based in the United States, but we have a very global footprint. So every company is location tagged as well. And we also track which companies end up working, which, which ones end up shutting down and are able to derive trends in that way. Um, the data in this directory has been used in a variety of interesting ways, just reporting on trends, but also looking at, for example, the diversity of the kind of entrepreneurs who are founding these kind of companies. And that's something that we're expanding upon as well. The, this is a continuous effort and some of the big challenges are continuously expanding the coverage, making sure we coverage a broad swath of activity in the space, continuously improving our metadata. Uh, we have a particular effort going on to deepen our categorization. And then in addition to use this data to actually derive insights that are helpful for the ecosystem and move the field forward. If you are interested in contributing to this effort, my email address is peter at codex.stanford.edu. Always happy to answer questions or to talk about how you can get involved. Oh, the category. Can you go back to that? Uh, well, I don't know how to turn this off now, but we'll we'll follow up separately. And and you see the categorization on our database too, by the way. So techindex.law.stanford.edu. 
you see all the different categories. But yeah, and then I'm sure uh, Peter can give you more information about that too. All right, cool. Thank you, Peter. Great to have you. Uh, Megan, are you there? Yes, I'm here. All right, so Megan is usually here <laughs> uh, at the law school. She's actually our residential fellow. Uh, unfortunately, she couldn't be here in person today. But Megan, now you have three minutes to just <laughs> introduce yourself and your work. Okay, sure. Um, so I'm just going to start. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, as uh, Roland had mentioned, I'm the residential fellow at Codex. Uh, last year, I looked at three questions. How could we understand the law better? How should we represent the law? And how do we construct the law? And really what I was trying to do with this uh, was ask the question, what can be revealed by the law's linguistic fingerprint? So in answering last year's question, I began to define my research through our flagship project, the Computable Contracts Insurance Initiative. Um, and this year, as discussed by Professor Oliver Goodenough, we really refined our research agenda and we've got all cylinders fired um, to push forward this initiative. So we have three new questions. Um, how could we understand insurance better? How should we represent insurance contracts? And how do we construct insurance policies? And really, I ask these three questions as sort of mirroring the past, present, and future of insurance, that to understand the insurance ecosystem and the complexity and intellectual richness of the space, we have to gather how insurance contracts are sort of currently drafted. And so, how do we really get there? And a lot of my research then is more focused on the ghosts of insurance past and present. Um, more specifically, how has natural language affected the drafting and interpretation of our insurance contracts? So insurance disputes related to word meaning arise from the lack of clarity around rules governing the benefits and exclusions of insurance policies. This can lead to costly and unfavorable outcomes for insurers and place undue burdens on policyholders to engage with appealing their denied claims. Accordingly, we investigate the vagueness of contractual language and insurance policies across three branches, elasticity, categorical ambiguity and vagueness, and logical coherence. In the past year, um, another one of our Codex fellows, Claudia Galka, and I, we put forward this notion of elasticity and we drew on Claudia's reinsurance expertise and we sought to determine whether that words often stretch beyond the sentence meaning have an impact on contractual risk, for example, renegotiation or even arbitration. We considered how vagueness of our words may be a reflection of our implicit positions and in, circum circum uh, in certain circumstances, the use of vague language and infusing linguistic space is not only acceptable, but highly intentional. And so this type of vagueness, we call it as elasticity. What we discovered is that diagnosing elasticity and establishing a metric around it provides us a lens behind the unspoken. We see this as particularly relevant for negotiated contracts, where having a deeper understanding of the linguistic framing is helpful for both parties. This is because embedded in the language is the DNA behind implicit knowledge. Um, this past year, we put forward our initial semantic framework, our approach to measuring elasticity. In the coming year, we hope to experiment with more clauses and tethering contractual wording to their outcomes. Furthermore, we see that in the insurance space, there's a limited view into the types of scenarios that lead to dispute by virtue of the language. So our intention is to understand the general variation in the interpretation of policy wording, as well as investigate the conditions that affect these interpretational judgments. The data we seek to collect can assist with disambiguating contractual language before a dispute arises. And furthermore, we see that this could contribute to the development of a common insurance semantics, as well as systematic detection of clauses that lead to possible interpretational disputes. Um, and so we're in the process now of refining these experiments. We're trying to ask, where is the locus of vagueness? Is it entirely linguistic? And if so, is it specifically owed to the open texture of the language? Um, that is explained for some of these um, information asymmetries that the average consumer is plagued by. Um, put differently, what is it that the lay person does not know about their insurance coverage? Is it that the word meaning lacks clarity or precision, or is it the organizational structure that is fostering vagueness? Um, for example, A, B, and C are covered, but Y is excluded with the exception of X. What is the role of the exceptions to the exclusions when you see your insurance policy? And could this be reframed as affirmative coverage? 
Um, and so we see law students, we need your help. We'll be extending these experiments that we've started over the course of the summer and the past year to investigate the interpretational gap in contractual wording across the lay population, law students, and legal experts, for example, senior partners and law professors. If you're interested in participating, please reach out to me. This is a paid opportunity. <laughs> all right, great. All in all. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Megan. This is great. Uh, thank you for that overview. Uh, we also have classes in computational law, and um, Jay will be here to speak more about this as well, but we have a policy practicum coming this winter term. We call it Redefining Insurance Solutions. Um, and so any, if you have any questions on how to get involved, please reach out to me. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Megan. And yeah, Megan's a linguist and lawyer and legal technologist. And what's so interesting about her work is really because it so shows us a path forward and how we can sort of um, kind of bridge uh, natural language and, you know, which is sort of the legacy system we use to create uh, contracts uh, with this new kind of era of computational contracts where we create these contracts uh, natively. And so there's a really important bridging function here. And Megan's doing really fantastic work here. And, so uh, reach out to Megan if you want to learn more. All right, thank you again, Megan. So, so thank you, Jay. You're next. We already had a. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You have the two-minute elevator pitch. Yeah. 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 Uh, I do, yeah, sure. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> All right, uh, we weren't able to pull up slides, but uh, I can talk to you guys. Um, first of all, really excited to see all of you here. Um, I've been affiliated with uh, Codex for the past, I think it's 13 years working with Roland. We were very lucky if we saw this number of people in our annual conference. So, so to see this number come out to meet Codex is really just inspiring um, to be affiliated so long and to see law students and computer science together. Um, we've really been trying to, and Roland and Mike Genestreth have been really pioneering uh, the space of legal technology here at Stanford and also nationally. And it's really been a labor of love. All the people you've seen up here have been, have been toiling for many years. I've worked with them. Um, an area which we've been toiling on as well is really offering here at Stanford classes which are very unique that actually bring you together with computer scientists, um, with business school students, and also uh, lawyers, of course. And the most current offering that, that Megan alluded to was redefining insurance, providing um, solutions uh, in the insurance space that provide more accessibility and more uh, transparency in the insurance space. This builds on a lot of classes we've been teaching in the past. We've taught classes in the areas of legal informatics, um, introduction to legal technology. Uh, we've, I've had the opportunity to, to teach the past six years classes like um, social impact AI and law, exponential innovations AI and law, which basically bring together in this class will be the same, bring together computer scientists, lawyers, and also in this case, humanity students to go ahead and attack this idea of how do you make insurance more accessible and transparent by first bringing together um, some regulators from NAIC. We alluded to it earlier, but this is the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. We're working closely with them and they're asking us, how do we as students come together and build some solutions that we can actually use in the real world and make it better for consumers to have more understandable, more um, transparent sort of solutions for consumers. And over the course of 10 weeks, this will be offered in winter of 22-23, uh, and we uh, welcome you to join this course. We'll actually ask you a few challenges. There'll be kind of a, a boil room where we'll ask you, first of all, to um, develop solutions as entrepreneurs to come together with computer scientists and lawyers and actually, and also humanities students and think of solutions of how to make, to solve this policy challenge they've presented. And then take the other angle, which you as lawyers know very well as regulators, that is this actually going to be ethical? Is this something that is going to be legal? Is this something that actually will serve the needs of consumers? And then at the end of the course, bring back those same folks from NAIC and they'll listen to your, um, your solutions and they'll determine, are these solutions we can actually implement um, potentially at the, uh, at the, at, at their particular um, association and maybe promulgate 
in potential legislation. That's the ideal goal, of course. At the very least, they'll they'll have a tank, a shark tank style sort of um, way of actually analyzing and providing feedback to each of these teams of students to develop their policy solutions. Oh, so we have it up here. Um, I always like to surround myself with all stars, and so you can't see them below, but the actual co-lecturers are actually Roland Vogel, um, who's been a co-lecturer with me for many years, and uh, and also exec director, of course, of Codex. Um, Margaret Hagen, who is the legal design uh, lab, uh, pi a pioneer in actually introducing design to the area of, of, of law and regulation. She'll be a co-lecturer, as well as Megan Ma. She gave you a taste of her of her specialty, but she's actually a PhD in the area of linguistics, and she'll shed more light on, on also the insurance space, which she knows well. So again, this is offered in winter quarter 22-23. We're really excited to get you in there, and we oftentimes only have like three days to do these courses. This time we have 10 weeks. So we get a little bit of breathing room, and uh, we're really excited to see uh, some law students who are here, and also computer science and business school students and MI students join us in this experiment uh, that we're gonna be offering to, to all of you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jay. Tibo, are you there? I'm here, yeah. So Tibo, if I could ask you to just do a really quick elevator pitch. I would be if very quick. Yeah, all right. So we're really running out of time. Sure, I've changed the slides when you, gave us four minutes. I said, since we only have four minutes, what I've done is that- well, now it's now- <laughs> I've put a card, I will do it in one You have to change minute. him again. <laughs> uh, but you can take, uh, I'm the world's, uh, the person who generates the most QR codes uh, around the world. So be ready with the smartphone. This is the first one you want to get. This is the QR code to this presentation. Uh, if you want to get more information. Uh, the basic idea is that- We'll, we'll distribute it, we'll send it out. <laughs> We we uh, fight fire with fire. So what we do is that we combine computational law that you heard about today and antitrust and computational antitrust makes Jerry Seinfeld very happy. Um, and so here's another QR code, but you don't have the time to take a picture. Uh, the long story short is that we basically try to see how computational tools can help competition agencies, but also companies. So we published lots of research already uh, on, on our websites uh, uh, regarding how those tools here, machine learning, network analysis, NLP could help uh, those antitrust agencies. We are working with the FTC, the DOJ, and 65 other uh, competition agencies. Uh, we've published the report, uh, but what I want to show you, and this would take just a 20 seconds, is that we have more work coming and actually something that we'll be publishing tomorrow. And here's the QR code. Uh, is how you can also design uh, computational tools to help companies better uh, comply with antitrust. So what I've done here is that I transposed EU competition law into a decision tree that I've put into an API. Uh, again, you can access if, if you have a chance to, to take a picture of the QR code. And the very last one, I suppose, is the conference that we will organize in December. Uh, it will be uh, online for sure, and maybe uh, also a, a physical component. Uh, so that's the very last QR code. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, please feel free to, to reach out to me. Uh, the email address is on the screen and uh, have a good lunch. <laughs>
digitizing um, the serving of process kind of process. Anyways, if you want to learn more, there'll be other opportunities where you learn from all uh, these other fellows here. I hope I didn't forget any. Oh, here's Amelie, who's also doing great work uh, in the immigration space. Um, and so, yeah, so anyway, so and that Jerry Kaplan, he's also a graduate of our program. Great to have you. Uh, and yeah, are there any questions or are you all ready to run out and <laughs> screaming and grab your lunch? But anyways, it was great to have you. Thank you so much. This was meant to give you an idea. There's a lot going on in the center. And uh, yeah, thank you all for coming. Enjoy lunch. Thank <laughs> you.